Awesome. We are live. What is up? All right. So, welcome everybody. 40K Dirtbags. Uh, we got Jeff here who actually just won. What was the GT called? Uh, it was the U.S. Open U uh, down in Tampa. U.S. Open Games Workshop provided down in Tampa. And I'm just super excited because we he played Adeptus Sororitas, which everybody has been saying is bottom tier not competitive all that stuff and jeff here goes fucking nine and oh at one of the hardest gts in the world against some of the hardest competition in the world and we got him on the channel uh live interview so jeff welcome it's great to be here um as i said it was kind of a fairy tale moment um i had plenty of people uh, just coming up to me at the event be like all right man i'm rooting for you I want to believe. I was like, that's right. It's about belief. It's about miracles. It can happen. And Jeff, we already talked like about, about a half an hour and it has been literally nonstop talking. So I'm super excited for this interview because I also play sisters, not as much obviously as you, but you've been playing sisters. Tell us since like eighth edition it was. So basically, yeah, basically um, I got back in 40k with sisters. Uh, so it was the very end of eighth going into ninth. Um, uh, ninth sounded pretty interesting the way they were changing editions, and I was like, oh, this sounds really cool. I'm, I'm, I'm interested. And then they released this beautiful new range for sisters. I always wanted to collect the army. I was finally in a position where I could collect the army. So I just jumped in, and I was like, this army's really fun to play. And I just kept playing them through all of ninth edition. Uh, and right into tenth, didn't didn't slow me down. So that's, that's perfect, is because when you like if you're in the competitive like especially for Arterbor and those guys that that you beat um they hop around in armies like they just basically play top metas like they hop from army to army stuff like that you are a true adeptus sororities player where you've been playing for fucking addition and a half now which i 100 percent respect you know a tenth of but you, you are 100 percent have the respect of every sisters play out there because you've stuck with them the entire time now they were good uh in ninth edition and they just kind of got dropped off the meta in 10th and you were like fuck it i'm playing them still they're amazing i love the lore all that stuff so yep. well, i mean in, in ninth they weren't always good either uh they, they had their ups and their downs and i just played them i played them when they were at 55 percent win rate and i played them when they were at 30 percent and i still got results either way sometimes it was a lot harder than others but it's just always been a very fun army, and I think that's really at the end of the day what I'm looking for is I want an army where when I go to the table, I feel like my decisions will impact my result, and I feel like what I'd like to do is what the army's going to let me do, and that's what Sisters has always been. So the lore is great. I love the I love the models, and I love how they play. Their play style, I just think, is a lot of fun. Now, with the list that we have here, we've been going over it where you are uh... – it's just a list that is just a list. Like it's nothing spammable. It's nothing crazy. Um, every, everybody keeps asking in chat what the noise was. I'm trying to get it because you're coming in a little bit low on 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 our end. So I'm trying to figure out if I can get you. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out if I can get you a little bit higher. All right, let me see if I can get my noise cancellation to not not catch you out too bad. <laughs> and I'm also trying to set it up because I think I had it set up last stream where it was like perfect, but when I hit this button, the noise like goes crazy so i think i just have to go to discord and change my input to output uh and see if we can get that going so right, sorry one second no problem and to answer your earlier comment about mm -hmm. whether or not it was a honest list and i've seen comments one comment that made me laugh is someone saying it looks like you're just what he owns <laughs> and to some extent, that is true, actually. Uh, you know, I don't have three of everything in the sisters' range, but I've kind of collected two of the units that I like. So, on the one hand, it is what I own, but on the other hand, it is also, I've kind of built towards the stuff I like. And even if I had three of everything, I still would be in this ballpark, actually. And there's nothing in here that's in here just because I had no other choice. Like, I, I had other choices, and this is where I ended up. Well, that's that, that's good, because like again, I'm I'm coming from Chaos Space Marines where I'm literally running 
six boxes of Accursed Cultists. And it's very hard for people to get into that list <laughs> specifically because nobody wants to spend three, four hundred dollars buying that fucking list. But your list seems 100 percent doable. I think the most expensive ones are the tanks, which are like eighty dollars now from Games Workshop. But so I guess we can go down the list real quick. Uh, it's, it's up on the screen for everybody that, that's watching on YouTube. But uh, we can start at the top. I'm sure you memorize this because you've been running this for a while now, which we'll get into how long you know we've been tweaking the list and stuff. But start at the top. We got Morn uh, Obviously, it should be almost what every every sister's list should have her. Um, I won't say every sister's list should have her, but she definitely is a great pick. Like, uh, you need a good reason to not have Morn is I think how I'll describe it. Um, where there, 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 there probably is a list out there, and we have seen one recently that doesn't have her, but you really need a game plan where you're leaving her at home because she is a humongous value package, when, especially when you combine her point upgrade, which gives her a couple of bodyguards, um, because that's all the Paragons, unfortunately, are. I love them. I own nine, um, but unfortunately, I'm only going to run the squad with Fall right now because right now, the way they're priced, you really can't run them on their own, but... With Fall, absolutely. I, I think she is a wonderful starting place for every sister's list. Yeah, full, full rerolls. back out of that list. Yeah, you only pull her back out of that list if you've got a darn good reason. Also, the model is incredible. Oh my god, yeah. The, the model, the, the war suits look amazing. Like, they're just, it's just such a cool combo. Have, have you, I guess we'll get into the technical, but let, let's keep going over the list. St. Celestine's another almost perfect model to include in, in any sister's list. W what's her main thing for you like i saw um, you deep struck her almost every people, game yeah so a lot of folks uh try to treat celestine as like a character you bring in and you hit people with um i found that she's not very good at that actually uh despite what her stat line shows uh, my celestine very rarely kills anything uh, she's pretty good at bouncing off just about any target in the game um, and my finals against jack she couldn't kill two chaos bomb but um what she is good at is staying alive um and even though against quentin she didn't come back to life about 50% of the time, she will make that to a roll and come back to life, which is pretty big. And opponents have to play around it, which is a big thing. It, it, there's a certain psychological pressure that she gives you. And that two-up save, especially with the way that 10th works with her joining the unit and her Gemini, um, that two-up, four-up combo means that you can basically bubble wrap a squad of Seraphim and make them just an infuriating <laughs> on your opponent's side. Uh, because they have to throw real guns to kill the squad of five basic infantry. And if they don't, then it's going to move into the middle of their, their backfield and then overwatch anything that moves to death. Yeah, with all the flamers. Yeah. Immediately, yeah, it, it immediately becomes a problem that they have to resolve. And they have to resolve it using real units. Uh, and at that point, it's incredibly cost effective. And Junith I saw was a new ad in 10th edition. Like, I, I, she's still in the box for me. I still haven't put her together. But her bringing the extra CP. Exactly, exactly. Like, she, I guess, is an auto include with, for the extra CP now? Yeah, um, so I wouldn't say she's an auto include. Uh, it is possible to play without her. Um, I just think sisters, a lot of our strength is tied up in stratagems. Um, we have the grenade strat on every infantry unit. Yeah, army. amazing. We have tank shock. We have a really good tank shock with paragons. We have some pretty powerful strats. Reviving characters is good, but so is suffering and sacrifice. So is our plus one to wounded melee. Uh, so is shooting back when you get shot at. There's a lot of just neat tricks that we can pull. Fighting on death for 2 CP is always a dangerous threat. It makes people have to respect more than goal. Uh, and so, you know, Spirit of the Martyr there for, for the, the fight on death for 2 CP. There, there, there are some really good strats in Sisters, and ideally, you're good enough at scoring secondaries that you shouldn't be relying on discarding one every turn for that bonus command point. You should be trying to score those. So ideally, you don't want to be having your, your command point game be tied to your, your secondary. You want it to be just an automatic thing. Mm -hmm. um, basically, the way I view Judith is she is roughly three free mortal wounds from any unit in my army every turn because that's a grenade, basically. Yeah. And, and that is an ability that I would pay 90 points for, especially because she makes a, a battle sister squad a little more durable. She's got a heavy flamer that's twin lane. She, she hits decently hard. She so, hits hard in combat. Yeah, I saw that. Um, <laughs> like she doesn't hit amazingly, but with Miracle Dice and a little bit of, you know, her, her units below starting strength, plus when it hit and wound, all of a sudden, yeah, she will hurt people. I mean, she's strength six, so. Yeah, um, and minus one to uh, to hit always, like for the unit, is really good. Yeah, it's really beneficial. I mean, especially when people are coming in and you saying, oh, I'm going to hit you with my ten attacks, I hit up twos, I'm like, well, they're all on threes now. 
instead of one miss, you're up to like three misses. Yeah, oh, yeah. Your math is wrong, and you're not killing the whole squad. Yep, yep. Uh, and so, so yeah, she's really useful. Um, you know, I never had her previously because I was a Valor Star player for all of my edition, just full stop. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. Well, correct, correction, I was an Order of the Eternal Crucible player for all of my edition. There you go. I was a minor, an Order Minoris player. Um, but as the order Menoris, that was literally just take a major order without the relic. And I was like, okay, I don't need the relic anyway. So, um, so yeah, so I, you know, she was only for martyred ladies, so I just didn't buy it because she wasn't my order. Exactly. Uh, but now that she's available in tenth, I can take the full mobile. I can strap it on top of an emulator if I really want to. But um, for the most part, she's usually on the board with the squad's ancestors, and she has proven herself to be reliably valuable. Just about every game. Just the command points are just too generally useful. And when 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 pitch comes to shove late in the game, she's a powerful model to have. Uh, and I think a lot of sisters' models behave that way. Where in the late game, where the major power players have been removed because you know you've you've already hit each other a bunch of times, and you're down to that scrappy end game. All of a sudden, all these sisters' characters they can just kind of come out and get you on twos, and <laughs> make you make four saves at minus two. It's like, at that point, it's just down to those little bits of damage to finish the job. They're really good at kind of sealing the deal. Uh, and she's a really good one for that, especially because she's got the heavy flamer uh, built in, so she can do it on Overwatch. So, you know, if, you, if they have a squad of three infantry left to try and move on to something, you can kind of deny that. Yeah, and, and I mean, all the points just drop significantly. Like, going to Ball, 125 points compared to, what, 340? <laughs> like, last edition was... Kind of well, insane. Yeah, well, edition, 280 or whatever. It was 280. Yeah. It was 280 at the end of the last edition, and she was definitely way more powerful in the last edition. However, um, with the point drop, I think she's still definitely worth it. Yeah. Um, I, I think it was very important. When the, when, the, when the points changed, Sisters did change a little bit. Um, but in a lot of ways, my list didn't change that much when the editions uh, flipped over. That's good. Um, the only thing that I lost was my sacrosense, which I'm a little sad about. I do have 18 that I painted. <laughs> I was running 30. <laughs> so I was, I was full bore, 30, 30 shield checks. Um, yeah, I bought three boxes and I converted one extra out of each one. So, so that's how I got to 18. It's kind of a weird number. <laughs> uh, and then we got the Palatine, which uh, I think yeah. is amazing now. With so, so this, I think, does go in every sister's list. I think if you don't take this as a sister's player, you're making a mistake. I mean, I'm an obstinate player. I'm all about doing my own thing, um, as evidenced by this list and what I've done. Um, but that being said, this is such an incredibly valuable combo, and it's so incredibly cheap. Um, in our index, we have, I want to say, two real melee threats. We've got a couple of like little melee threats, like Arc of Flagellants are like, moderately threatening. The Triumph is moderately threatening. Um, the Palatine can and will kill anything in this game. Um, you know, if you give her enough shot at it, she will hurt any unit in the game. And the uh, Vol unit will kill any unit in this game. Like, you know, th- th- they'll do damage to it. Like, there's nothing that can just take them and not worry about it. Yeah. Um, it went, so the Palatine, the main thing, obviously, everyone knows, you have the, you know, Rapturous Blows is her built-in ability. Mm. You discard a Miracle Die, and you're always going to have a Junk Miracle Die to discard. And you're going to get a mortal wound every time you make a wound. Um, we've got a strap for plus one to wound. She gives her unit lethal hits. Um, so as you'll see later with the Novitiates, there's ways to get those lethal hits to proc somewhat reliably. Um, and so at that point, you're getting five mortal wounds uh, just, for, just for showing up. And if she's injured, six. <laughs> um, and then um, the damage is three per hit. And then when she's injured, four. So theoretically, you're looking at six attacks at four damage a pop. That's 24 damage, and then six mortal wounds on top. So you, you can theory, theoretically you can one round a night. Uh, it won't happen, but it could. And that's because of the blade of uh, Eleanor, correct? Yes, and that that is an upgrade that you just you you only stick it on a Palatine. It's no good whatsoever on a Cannoness. The Cannoness, unfortunately, in this edition is pretty poor. <laughs> um, I would really love for GW to kind of rethink the Cannoness. Uh, She's supposed to be better. Can, Right than the than yeah, the Yeah, she is, and unfortunately, the Canness just her abilities are kind of dysfunctional at the moment. Um, I've tried running so in ninth edition there was a, a Canness where you could make them incredibly tanky and yeah. it was a solo operative. Yep, uh, it just doesn't really work very well in tenth edition. Mm. Uh, I would love for it to work, and I'm I'm hoping at the Codex that we might get enhancements that really kind of make that possible. But right now, that's just not an option. Yeah, so, we're gonna get a ton uh, with the Codex coming out. Yeah, yeah, so unfortunately for now, the Canon S has to just take a vacation, but uh, I expect with the Codex, she'll be back. Mm-hmm. 
I'm not too worried about it. He, here's somebody else that I haven't ran in ten, or ninth edition was the uh, uh, Magifier with the big staff. Ninth edition. Yep. So she's the lady with the big statue on a stick. Um, not to be confused with all of our other ladies who have something on the end of the stick. Yep. Um, the Magifier is an interesting one. She was pretty terrible in ninth edition. She was incredible in eighth edition, um, and so that's why I bought the model one originally. Uh, but back in tenth edition. Uh, at first, I kind of overlooked her. I was looking at the Hospitaller. I was looking at the Dialogus and a lot mm -hmm. of the other things that other people were looking at. Mm -hmm. But I, I've consistently had a problem where at events, I have a tendency to end the event with between, I want to say, 9 and 15 ones and twos in my Miracle <laughs> uh, I'm really good at rolling twos on Miracle Dice. Yeah. It's just a, a yeah. skill that I have. Mm -hmm. And so when I was looking for ways to improve that situation, um, and I didn't have the points left for something like the Triumph, also, mine's not done being painted, and I'm trying to take my time on that model. Yeah, it's such a beautiful um, model. And so, uh, I was looking through it, and I saw that the Imagifier had this ability that within 12 inches, you could re-roll the Miracle Dice. So I was like, wait, that's actually... Every time. Uh, Every time. Yeah, and the, like, uh, also fuck. before Benvolt, which doesn't wait, hurt. Yeah. <laughs> it's like uh, Abaddon so, walking so, around. So I was like, yeah, and so all of a sudden, I was just like, wait a second, I can actually just take this lady, put her on one of my Battle Sister squads near the middle of my army, and then... And as the first few turns go through, I can actually just re-roll these miracle dice that I'm generating as units die. And I can actually kind of keep myself fueled with, I just need a four or five or a six, really. Um, so about half of the time I'm going to get it. With that re-roll, it's, it's a little bit better. It's like maybe 75% of the time. And so like I can actually make that work. And then the litany of faith are there so that those remaining bad miracle dice can slowly be cycled. And some of them will actually turn out being all right. Um, and some of them are going to stay bad, but I mean, that's just the, the nature of a dice game. There, there was something that you brought up last time we talked where most people don't see that or in the, in the enhancement where if I certainly, did. if half the unit is below strength, then she gets to roll three up to three miracle dice a turn. Yes. And so I, I played all of Tampa thinking that it was only when she herself was below half. Exactly. So that was one of those uh, little things that I, you know, after the fact, someone pointed out that, oh yeah, he took it for that ability. And I was like, oh, <laughs> like I knew that because I read it at one point in time, but I probably forgot about it. And yeah. So I'd been playing it as if it was the Blade of St. Eleanor and it yep. had to be the character herself. So it, it, um, Yeah, exactly. Sisters are an army that have so many layers of interesting interactions that, um, you really do get a lot of benefit from knowing the rules very exhaustively. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, even I who played it a lot, uh, I'm still working on getting kind of familiar with the 10th edition index. And that, I think, you know, as we get ready to move into the next sections, I think, and the next unit will be a great example of this, is where my opinions and kind of the common opinion of the internet writ large diverged pretty sharply because I looked at the sister's index even when it's just dropped, even before the point drops, and I thought, there's a lot here. Um, and this next unit, Battle Sisters, are one of the units that I thought from the get-go were very good. You have to, when you so, when you jump into Sisters, there's so much you have to memorize. Like, they have so many rules that not a lot of other codexes have. Like, when you're looking at, at how much how many Miracle Dice you can get in a turn is kind of crazy. I, I thought getting once yes. every command phase was crazy. <laughs> like they changed that in ninth where like you get one for you, one for your opponent, one for like that was a lot. And then when yeah. people died, you get like it, now it's just fucking doubled, if not tripled the amount of yeah. miracle well, dice you get. Oh yeah, I'm getting, I'm, I'm average, I'm getting three to four times as many miracle dice in the game. So I was getting in ninth edition. <laughs> Part of it is because some matchups in ninth edition, you just never got miracle dice. Mm -hmm. If you're playing against knights and custodies, you just didn't get any because you could only get them for killing units. And if the opponent only has like six units, yep. you're not getting miracle dice. Yep. Um, and so the change to it being based on our own units, I think was an incredible change. Yeah. And then the addition of abilities to generate and modify them, I think was also an incredible change for the army. And Huge. So when I saw Battle Sisters and I read their data sheet, um, you know, the multi melted thing, obviously, no one's happy that your only anti tank is winning on a five. However, when I read the Defenders of the Faith ability, I was like, this is hands down, I'm running multiple squads of Battle Sisters. At the time, I thought I'd be running two. Um, then I watched Bricky do a, a video where he said I took five squads to an event, and this is how it went. I was like, you know, actually, Bricky, I think you're on something, so I bumped it up to three because that's what I own. Um, and I loved it. Um, I've never been unhappy to be running multiple squads of Battle Sisters. 
They're surprisingly durable in 10th edition. The one good gun in the unit is hidden behind nine other bodies. Um, and, Are you talking about the multi melter? The miracle dice, the multi melter, yes. Mm-hmm. And, and you, you do also get a combi weapon, and that'll do death wounds to infantry. Mm-hmm. Um, and you'll have a special weapon, and if you're smart, you'll take both the guns, or if you're like me, you'll take one of each, because it's cool. I was um, going to ask you that. You, I saw you took one of each. Do you have like a specific role I mean, for I, I, each I squad? Like I, I, have to, I, I, I too, actually. There is actually a reason for each. Well, there's two reasons. One, it's the Holy Trinity. you got to put it somewhere. <laughs> um, yeah, so the second reason is uh, the squad that's furthest from the action typically is the one that's the storm bolter mm-hmm. the one that's coming out of the emulator has the melt gun and then junith is the one who gets the flamer because it gives you two flamers on the squad so it's actually mm. potentially an overwatch threat yes uh, that's yes. actually the reason for, for that that breakout but it's also sort of a fluff thing uh, gotcha. so a little bit of both so I then the fluff thing and said i like this but it also fits how i'm going to use these squads and would you do a, a heavy flamer instead of the multi-melter with junith or no uh I think having the multi multi is just too too valuable to have in there because it gives every single squad of battle sisters it gives them the ability to fish two dice out and if they fail in it form, I get to do eight damage. Yeah, yeah, instantly. Just, and just being able to just auto bring six. that from multiple locations and for them to get rid of my ability to do that, they have to kill thirty power armor bodies. <laughs> Makes sense. Yes, they're only key three with one wound, but it's still thirty power armor bodies, almost certainly in cover. Half of them with a four pin bone. On the half, a third of them with a four pin bone, and a third of them with my sweat to be to be hit. And then having three of them at the end of your command phase for each objective mark you control that is one or more of the units in your army that are ability to you get one miracle die. So basically, you get one in the beginning of your command phase, and then if you are on let's say two, does that include your own objective in your own deployment zone? Absolutely, it does. <laughs> so that's every game that two turn. My first turn. The start of every game, start of my first turn, I'm getting two, two miracle dice. That is one crazy. For one for my home objective. Crazy. I've had turns where I picked up five miracle dice. <laughs> just from the, the start of the turn. And, and even if one miracle guy's miracle alive, miracle doesn't say has to pass it, it, battle shock. You know, it's it's an it's an, and the, the timing even works out so that it works on the first turn before you hold the objective because it, because of the timing it's oh the end of the God. phase. You take control of the objective. That's so good. That That's so good. So it's, it, it is legitimately, uh, when, as I said, when I saw Battle Sisters, this is where I started to diverge from um, an opinion. Again, I think this is because I was a Valorous Heart player and not a Bloody Rose player. <laughs> Bloody Rose players looked at the index and they said, I can't play Bloody Rose anymore. This is terrible. And I agree, Bloody Rose is dead. And that is sad for Bloody Rose players. Um, you really can't make that work right now. Sisters is not a just throw missiles of melee units at the enemy army. Right now, they're very much a positioning and shooting army yep. with a lot of trade potential. 100%. And, you know, it's the way that I've always loved to play Sisters, so I currently think Sisters are about the most fun they've ever been. Um, but that being said, uh, you do have a problem where it's like, you have to be ready to play that style. Um, but yeah, Battle Sisters, I think, are incredible. The new Cherubs actually are good. Uh, they let you cycle. My unit of, so one of these units of Battle Sisters is going to get Combat Squad. If you use a little sneak preview for the Emulator that we're going to get to. Yeah, we'll get to uh, that. <laughs> will combat squad them, and each of the squads gets a Cherub because it's a once per squad ability, and they become two separate squads. Um, and so the squad that is on the home objective um, is going to just advance one inch and use up one of my bad miracle dice and cycle it. It's just a little bonus value that you should get for free just by having a squad of five battle sisters sitting on your home address. So there, um, let me pause there. Um, when you split them into two different units because of the emulator, which is one of the only things that can combat squad in the entire 40K, there you go. Uh, I saw that. I was like, wait, there's a little special rule here. Holy shit. I've never seen this before. Um, when you make two units of five, are you saying that you put a cherub in between both units so it's two cherubs that is correct oh my I've god this with judges i checked this with judges and so far all of them have ruled it that way i need to buy more cherubs <laughs> there are two separate units as soon as they've been split they oh my all god purposes that it's two distinct units that is huge that is that wow so that the squad that's on my home objective when i have a one of my miracle pull i'll just advance them in place and roll that one into something else yeah, and because ones used to be great ninth, now ones kind of suck. Yeah, not, they have no purpose. They have no purpose. Nothing. So ones and twos are the only miracle that you can't do anything. Yeah. Uh, I mean, a two you can sometimes get value out of, but like a one truly has no purpose. But um, like for a two, if you only need a two inch advance, sure, use the two. Um, but otherwise, 
like generally speaking, you're aiming for a four or better on your miracle dice. That'll let you start triggering invulns, and that's really what matters. Yeah. But invulns or wound rolls are usually what you're looking for. Definitely. When you're plus one to wound, a four up will do it. So. And then yeah, so that's three spots of battle sisters. Um, I think that they're fantastic. I think you can't get more battle sisters than being a decent chunk of battle sisters themselves on the battlefield. So we already went over the emulator where you can split a unit. Now, since you have two, you can technically split split two ten mans into four five mans, correct? I could. Yep. Yeah, I could do that. Typically, I don't, however, because of the other special rule that the emulator has. Uh, so it has a rule called fire support, where if it shoots and hits a target, then the people who are inside, when they get out, get full wound rerolls into that target. And so that means that when I put my uh, retributors inside of a, an emulator, that emulator, the one that happens to have the flamethrowers, so it can't miss, as I have missed with all of the other shots before. Um, so I take put in the flavor one, so it can't miss. Just no chance, no chance of failure there. Uh, those retributors are going to pop out. They're going to hit on fours, which is unfortunate. But with eight shots, you're still going to get four on average. And then they're going to be wounded, yes, on fives, but with full rerolls. So on average, you get I want to say two to three at that point. And at that point, you're likely to get one through. Off your miracle for damage. Use one of their two cherubs that they have to get a, a die back. And you're in business. And in one of my games, if we get to it, I'll, I'll say the retributors did some serious business um, thanks to those rerolls. So, uh, so that's why I have the two emulators. That's why one of them does have the flamethrower. Is because I want to guarantee that I proc that for those retributors. Just zero chance of failure. And you only have one squad of retributors, correct? Yeah. That's correct. So uh, because I don't, I don't think they're worth running without the emulator. He, here's a question: Would you do two? F- two 10 mans into, into four five mans and then on turn one just take one of the five mans out and then put the retributors in and then they can move up just to get into position i could oftentimes i'm having to pull the trigger because my opponent's really aggressive and they're not respecting what i can do and so i just pull the trigger turn one um that being said um there might be some matchups where i would feel like i just need that many small units typically i actually like having the two squads of 10 because it's a lot easier to have units some of the squad be alive below half strength if mm-hmm. you start at 10, mm-hmm. basically. It does weaken you a little bit against blast, but typically the one extra shot doesn't make that much of a difference compared to being able to have three or four models alive that are plus one to hit and wound. Okay. Um, so, so if you do that slightly wider thing, and also if I have a defensive buff that I'm applying the character that I'm trying to keep alive, like Junith, I mean, 10 bodies just gets more value than, than five. Okay, so one would be with the Mag- Magifier, with, which is a 10-man, and then another 10-man yep. with Junith, and then the two 5-mans would just be by themselves. Characters yeah, yep. got it. That's, that's how I read it for all of Tampa. Okay. So that makes sense. Yeah, because I'm thinking in my head, like, wow, you can split up. Yeah, because I'm trying to, like, imagine your list, because I, I haven't talked to you yet, but the uh, emulator is doing two fucking 5-man or four 5-man units is, is just awesome you know and, and i actually made a yeah, list so it, it is actually a great tech um, yeah and uh we did mention i did mention briefly when we talked about uh there's a guy named his username is mcwork i don't know his real name unfortunately uh i have not had the chance to meet him in person but he ran a list that was basically all about just splitting squads of sisters running squads of arcoflagellants and lots and lots of little tiny squads of death cult assassins <laughs> it was yeah just so many little tiny individual units. Two man units everywhere. Shipping all over the board. <laughs> Shipping all over the board, touching all the objectives, you know, doing all the secondaries. And that is a very valid way to play. Um, I prefer to have a little bit more of a hammer in my back pocket that I can use on anyone who gets too cheeky. Uh, and so that's kind of why I stuck with the, the build where I did, where I get a decent number. I think four Battle Sister squads is enough to be scoring pretty well. I mean, they're OC2, um, and they give me the bonus Miracle Dice. Um, but it also leave me with enough in the tank to get the rest of the list going. So, mm. so the Retributor yeah, Squad. Yep. We, we basically went over that. Yep. Basically, they have a reroll once to wound natively, but that doesn't usually matter. Usually all that matters is they're getting that full reroll on the turn they pop out, and usually they're going to waste somebody and then die. If they live, that's awesome. I yeah. just got massive value. And but you have a 15-inch threat range with the Immolator because they move 12, get out 3, and then you, you're with a 9 so technically, 24 yeah. inches, you can threaten with your fucking Meltas with full rerolls to wound. And melt a range. And then it's 18-inch range from the disembark point for just normal damage. Yeah, yeah like that's so, that's huge. 
They actually have a surprising amount of reach, which is very beneficial. Yeah. Um, they, they, there, there is a little bit of, with, before the towering change, there was definitely a little bit of an issue with the, you know, you couldn't pop out in front of like a Wraith Knight. Yep. But that's not a thing anymore. So. Yep. Hey, thanks, GW. I really appreciate that. <laughs> that changed, honestly, a lot of lists with, with uh, them getting rid of towering. Like, it makes you bring more fun lists instead of, like, only little units that have to hide behind a fucking wall, yeah, you know? I, I don't have to be as terrified of moving around the board. Yeah. That, I think, was a humongous benefit. Huge. I, I love that, that they changed that. The, so the whole issue of threat range is actually what leads to the next two things that I, I went with. Uh, those two castigators. Um I love this model personally. I think it's the best looking tank GW's ever made. So good. I just think it's beautiful. So good. Uh, that being said, I also love the Rogel Dorn. I just I love the Huge. Tanks. I love all the old firstborn tanks. He's like, ginormous. If it's, if it's treads, yeah, if it's a tank with treads, I'm a humongous fan. If it floats, eh. <laughs> the top ones, yeah. ones are pretty cool actually. Like those are the only hover tanks that really other ones are, are good, top ones are great, other hover tanks can go float away. Yeah. Sure. yeah. Um, but if it's got treads, I'm on. Uh, and well, so, Castigators, um, it is basically a Lehman Ross with a Predator's defensive profile. And Miracle Dice. And an Infall. So, it's not quite as well armored as a Lehman Ross, but it gives us something that the rest of the Codex just doesn't, which is range and volume. Um, the Castigator's main thing is that it has reach. And almost nothing else in the Codex has reach. Because um, we don't move particularly fast, Melta's their range went down. Um, Castigator still shoots 48 inches, mm -hmm. and it still hurts people. And it goes up to 36, when it's basically almost every gun it has. And you know, everyone says, well, it's just heavy bolters. But nine heavy bolter shots with sustained hits, which is a wonderful buff, I love it, um, will reasonably chunk through an armager. Like, I have I have had a Castigator chew an armager to bits in one round of shooting. Even you, even yeah. basic marines. You make them roll so. Oh, th this thing deletes marines. Dude, three up saves, they just die. Like I've noticed that playing yeah. playing gray knights minus four one AP, saves. three up save. I don't care if you have cover. You have a three up save. Fucking good luck. Yeah. You know, dead. Yeah, you only ignore cover on the battle camp. Still, they can't go past three up. So it's like, I I don't care. You have a cover save. You're still out of three up save. So it's like you're going to die. That's awesome. Absolutely. And like. Uh, so one thing that I, I've joked about is that since ninth edition, uh, in ninth edition this was true for me as well. Marines were always a great matchup for me. Um, apart from the era of desolation, Marines, uh, Marines have been a great matchup for me because like the moment a squad of Marines pops out, like we've got storm shields and lightning claws and we've got all this stuff and we're so dangerous. I'm like, would you like to roll twenty three up saves for me, please? Yep. And they're like, no, I really don't want to do that. I'm like, well, tough. That's what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> so, and yeah. now with Terminators and things coming out and aggressors, like aggressors are going to be this new big menace. I'm like, yes. However, the castigator is going to say, would you like to roll five four up saves and every one that you fail is a dead aggressor? And it's like, all right, you're done. Well, I, could you do it again for me, please? Yeah, yeah. And so D3, D6 plus three blast. Ignore yeah, cover. Oh my god. Eats infantry. Oh my god. Eats infantry alive. Terminators um, too. Yeah, it, it eats infantry of all flavors. Um and it's okay in the vehicles. Like the rerolls to hit and you make them roll out of saves again. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, I'm only wounding out of five and it's really hard targets. But if I make them roll three saves, odds are they fail one or two. That's three to six damage. Mm -hmm. It chips them away. Like yeah, it's a death by a thousand cuts. Yep. The castigator, you know, it does force the battle shock, which is cute. I think it's only mattered once where I turned off their ability to do a fight first strat, uh, which was cool. Yeah, but like like that was it. Mm -hmm. uh, but mostly, what matters is the ignore cover. A lot of people really like the auto cannons because they're twin linked, and I can understand the appeal. But I actually like having the range from the battle cannon um, because the battle cannon will have minimum the number of shots that the auto cannon has at long range, and almost always have more than the auto cannon at long range, and it does have a higher ceiling as well. Uh, You're also yeah because you, you're also ignoring because i i play um forge fiends which are just made to delete terminators so with the ignore yeah. cover and the two up save strength 10 anything terminator you're going to wound on twos compared to wounding on threes with the strength nine that is a huge difference killing terminators yeah. wounding on twos yeah. and 
So the twin link does that definitely help the autocannons get wounds in. But the problem is that those autocannons are functionally AP0 against some of those targets. Yep. Almost everyone will be in cover. Yep. Whereas the battle cannon is always going to give you that AP1. And so a Terminator going from a 2-up save to a 3-up save is a humongous difference. Huge. Uh, and so so that's, again, the Castigator. I, I love this model. I love this unit. Um, I think for the points, it's one of the best tanks in the game. It's just an all-around uh, gun platform that threatens almost every unit in the game. It yeah. will damage you. It may not kill you, but it will damage you. Yeah. Uh, if you get enough things that will damage you, you will eventually die. Like Here, that's just kind of how, they, how the list works. Here, here's a question. When I look at lists, I always think about what's in reserves and what's not in reserves. What's in deep strike, what's not in deep strike. Do you reserve any of your tanks coming in? Typically, no. Um, not... Now, I, I will say there have been some matchups where I've looked at it and said, I don't want to lose on the roll-off, so I'll, I'll deep strike a tank. But in Tampa, I didn't deep strike any tanks. I didn't reserve any tanks. Uh, you can't deep strike them. But I was <laughs> like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, I didn't reserve any vehicles uh, in Tampa. I, the only thing that went in reserve was the Difficult Assassins. The Caliph's Assassin was never in reserve, actually, because of polymorphia. Yep. Uh, but uh, the Seraphim and, and uh, Substein, that was it. Um, you can usually hide the tanks, um, and you want them to be shooting, basically, from the moment the opponent is to target. Uh, and so, usually the opponent doesn't target the Castigators right off the bat anyway, because there's other things that are pressing issues, like the Cannon Door, like the next thing on the list, which is the Mortifiers. Um, 60 points. Come and shoot quickly. Incredibly cheap. Shockingly durable, um, and while they're not as good at melee as they were in ninth edition, uh, ninth edition these things would pick up a squad of uh, you know van bets with no problem. Um, they don't do that anymore, but they're still dangerous. So you actually do have to deal with them. You can't just let these things charge you. Five up field of pain for defensive purposes. Five wounds. Yep. Five wounds. T six three up save because they're running them in units of one, so they get the anchor sarcophagus. Nice. So it's a 3-up save, 6-up interval, I don't feel no pain, T6. Like they have to shoot actual anti-tank guns to kill this thing. Um, and it has two heavy bolters. Again, by itself, that's not amazing, but it still does damage to people. It's going to kill Marines. Yes. Yeah, and it takes wounds away. Yep. You know, it, it hits your tank, it takes four wounds off, it charges you, it does six more. Your tank's down to like four health. Yep. It's a little 60 wounded idiot. I mean, yep. 60 point idiot. Yeah, like it's, it's, it's wonderful. Um, so when they die, you get a Miracle Dice. Um, they have a Deadly Demise 1, which did happen to me once and blew up one of my own characters. That was unfortunate, but hey. Um, but uh, they get sustained hits on the charge. So a lot of people prefer Penitent Engines, and I can definitely see the appeal. Um, Penitent Engines, basically, they don't have access to the, sar the, the sarcophagus, but they can advance the charge. And so I can understand why people want to run the Penitent Engines. But there's a few drawbacks to them. And so the reason that I run the Mortifiers instead is the Mortifiers are plus one on their weapon skill and ballistic skill. So they're threes instead of fours. And these guys don't reroll hits anymore. In ninth edition, they did, so it didn't matter nearly as much. In 10th edition, they don't reroll their hits. They reroll wounds because they're twin linked, but not hits. So the plus one weapon skill helps. Um, and Penitent Engines cannot take heavy bolters. Mortifiers can. And if it's a choice between two normal flamethrowers or two heavy bolters, I'm going to go with those two heavy bolters. Um, I, I so think... The engines are faster. I can definitely see the appeal and why people would take them. I, I, if someone takes them, I'm not going to say that's a bad choice. I think both of them are very good units. Um, it's just for the way that I like to play the game, Mortifiers made more sense to me. They can apply pressure from wherever they're standing because they've got two heavy bolters. And then they become a charge threat the moment they're within... I want to say about 16 inches of anybody. When I was seeing your games and you were playing these guys, you used them really just to kind of set up, hey, this guy's now in the center doing aerial denial, getting me the center objective. You have to deal with him or he's just going to get me points. So like you're not going to, you're using a more of like a secondary tool and like, hey, come at me, you know? And then yeah. people... Uh, they're, they're, they're a question that I ask my opponent that say, you have to answer this. You yeah. have to answer this question. You have to. Yeah, and so that's, they're a wonderful unit for that purpose. The penitent engines are better if you're like, I really want to have something that I can 
missile into a specific target. Exactly. Uh, that's really far away. And so there is a use for that. It just doesn't fit the way that I'm playing the army. Exactly. We, we uh, need secondary units, and the mortifiers are better at secondary units than the pendant engines. You know, So if you want to build a list with all fucking pendant engines, go ahead. But when you're really trying to build like a technical, hey, this is my secondary unit, you have to deal with it, 60 points. And a small amount of durability uh, from the three up versus the four up does make the mortifier slightly harder to shift. Yes. Again, if I'm just putting it out in those front areas and saying, hey, deal with this thing, uh, having that little bit of extra durability can help. But the fact that it can be hurting you even while it's <laughs> 24 inches away is yep. beneficial because at that point it can be like, you have to deal with it or it's just going to keep shooting at you. Yep. Uh, and if you if you do chip damage to it, it's going to start shooting at you and hitting on twos. I like it. Uh, I like so, it. Yeah, it's, it's a it's a lovely, lovely little unit. Paragon war suits. So these are a two hundred point uh, add on for Morven Hall. Mm -hmm. um, you don't take them otherwise, unfortunately. <laughs> um, yeah, you only need one unit of these guys now. Like you said, you could bring three. Now it's one. Yeah, well, even then, they were someone at GW is really scared of these things because they keep pricing them very high. Um, when it's basically just a super terminator. They've been pricing it as if it was two and a half terminators in a trench coat. It's more of like one and a half terminators <laughs> in a trench coat in terms of stats. Um, but the thing is, it is one and a half terminators in a trench coat, so you really can't just take it lightly. Uh, their melee profile has gotten a bit weaker than it used to be. So but much weaker. The tank shock yeah. has really kind of balanced that out a bit because on the way in, these things will reliably do four to five mortal wounds to you. Even wounding on fives with the tank shock? Yeah, because it's a 14 dice. Oh, because you're over. Got it. Yeah, you're going to be over the toughness of most of the targets. If you're going into a vehicle, who cares? Mm -hmm. You don't take shot. At. You just hit it with the stick. Yeah. Um, and vehicles tend not to have the involves. So you're less worried about it. Vault does the work. Um, <laughs> but the uh, shooting is plus one to wound, and then Vault's wounding on the breeze. And, just having yeah. this makes them amazing. The Righteous Paragons. It very rarely comes up, usually because they're either dead or what they're fighting with dead. But <laughs> those few times that it does come up, it is actually a very nice roll. And the thing is, their guns are still quite good, and the grenades are finally worth using. Mm -hmm. So in the prior edition, I would take them with the Storm Bolters. Because you would get two Storm Bolters, and you would just throw 24 dice per squad. And it was quite a lot of anti-infantry killing power. Now that's only one, a little less impressive. But the grenade launcher going up to strength 9 with the D3 damage... And the AP2 means that it actually does a respectable little bit of oomph to your, your anti-tank shooting. So three multi melters with three of these crack grenades with full rerolls uh, pretty reliably puts some damage on stuff. Uh, I mean, this squad with ball, um, it killed the Avatar uh, in shooting. One round? In one round. I mean, I, I threw a lot of other units at it as well. Uh -huh. um, that, and stuff is fake for the round and things like that. But at the end of the day, these are the ones that punch through, I want to say like eight, eight or nine wounds wow. um, into the avatar, which is quite a lot. Um, yeah. And these are also, these did get to go to work against um, Angron, but I mean, they did get to go to Overwatch where they killed the Berserkers. So we get to that part where we're talking about matchups. Like they, oh, they shoot shockingly well and they Overwatch surprisingly well. And with the rerolls and melee, they're not amazing, but Vol is enough of a monster still uh, that like they, they, they'll put any unit into the. You have to pay attention and respect it. So, uh, so. and you're always starting these guys yeah. on the table. Always, but they don't usually come out turn one. Um, so typically with the Paragons, they're going to wait a little bit and find a good time to show up. They're not going to just walk out and just kind of hang out there. They really don't want to be the ones getting hit first. Have you thought about them rapid ingressing? Um, I, I have not really budgeted for it before, um, partially because I don't want to give the opponent the option of just going to the middle and being out of range. Um, because the last couple times I tried putting them in reserves, I was against Eldar back with Phantasm before it was nerfed, mm. uh, and it went so badly for me that I just kind of shied away from it ever since. Got it. Uh, it is something that would be worth considering, um, but just generally speaking, I find that with a table with decent terrain, you can stage them pretty safely because they're, uh -huh. they're only on, I think, 40 or 50 millimeter. So they're not actually that big. Um, they're so, it's, it's one and a half terminators in a trench coat. It's not as big as you think it is. Um, and so they actually can, you know, you can stage them and they can then just pop out, throw a volley into something, and then potentially land a long charge, potentially land a short charge, potentially do no charge, but have already shot something and then overwatch. Like, 
they're a very strong unit, but they just generally don't want to be your front line. Yeah. They don't want to first wave in. Um, and that's where I see a lot of sisters players make mistakes, where they take their strongest units and they throw them in up front. Um, and a lot of times, sisters units really don't want to be taking an alpha strike on the chain. That, that's what I'm thinking, because if we rapid ingress, um, I don't care if they if they phantasm because I'm already you know nine inches away from them walking on the table edge. So if they if they phantasm, I mean if not there, you then move up eight, right? So then you move up eight, so then you're still technically within eight and a half. Oh, you can't nine. move if you rapid ingress. Well, yeah, with the rapid ingress you could. Yeah, so so you rapid ingress, they can't phantasm whatever. Now you're there, so then you can then move up and then shoot something else and then charge the thing that you really wanted to charge them. And now they're fucking in their backfield. And they're a self-buffing yeah. unit. Uh, I keep that on the skin. Yeah. Typically, I, I, I've kept them in the force because usually I'm having them kind of problem solve around my army. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's definitely, there's definitely a use for it, especially if you're against an opponent like uh, Triple Night Spinner. I can see that being a good way to use them. So, God, Triple Night Spinner is kind of deadly now. Able to, the biggest problem is that if they get screened out properly mm-hmm. by an opponent who's really kind of paying attention, mm-hmm. you'll have to bring them in. The, the range and the movement isn't long enough to mm-hmm. really threaten things you want to threaten. Mm-hmm. Um, because typically I have them at a fairly central location so yeah. they can pivot to wherever the battle is going badly for me. Um, that being said, there is definitely, especially if you're against them with a lot of indirect or something like that, uh, I'm not going to say that the rapid ingress is bad. Uh, I just haven't tried it since yeah yeah and again uh, th- this is uh, you going over your nine and oh victory trick. run yeah you know? this, this actually is a, a trick that I, I ought to try again so thank you for reminding of me of course i i try to make every list that i do with one unit that i'm going to rapid ingress like every single time no matter what this unit is going to be for rapid ingress for me right now which i'm 12 and 0 right now with the list that i'm currently running and a curse cultish unit rapid ingressing is fucking scary it can then advance and charge, okay, get plus one to wound, yeah, plus one to hit. It is, it is insane. So I'm just thinking, like, what in your in your list specifically? What could you rapid ingress that's going to be the most benefit to your army? Yeah, and I mean, you could definitely get some value out of Celestine that way. But I mean, doing it with, with Vault would actually be pretty interesting. Uh, Celestine again, another one. Yeah. To have all my CP already allotted as far as doing offensive strats and mm-hmm. defensive strats, but. Mm-hmm. I can see the value. So I'll definitely give that a try um, next time I take the list out. Um, awesome. See. Let's go. Dirtbag. Let's go. All right. Um, yeah, absolutely. So finally, some Seraphim. Um, I mean, their main thing is they're a useful utility thing. I had a few games at the event where I did join them to, to Celestine and a few where I didn't. It just oh, wow. Really whether I wanted to make them more di- more durable. Yeah. If I wanted to have multiple things that I could drop in multiple locations to do secondaries. What, kind of my process. what armies specifically would you do that with? Uh, against Eldar, I split them up. Okay. Uh, because I wanted to be able to drop them and have each one of them deal with one small group of five annoying fast things. Uh, okay. Um, and because turns out a squad of five swooping hawks doesn't enjoy four. Uh, <laughs> and you don't really need Celestine to get that job done. Yeah. Uh, whereas, like, you know, warp spiders will kill the Seraphim, but Celestine's a little harder to kill unless they spike in death wounds. Yeah. Uh, stuff like that. Um, in my game against Quentin, I made a mistake. I actually I killed all the targets that they were going to shoot to land, shoot, and get me a secondary by moving because they can shoot and then move again six inches. Yes, um, but saw that. I landed a trumpet and killed this far seer in melee, and I was like, oh, okay, that worked out better than I thought it would. <laughs> um, I got my secondary and I killed the far seer. Yeah. Um, so sometimes you get those happy little accidents. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the seraphim. The, their main purpose is being a disruptive tool. They can. You know, deal with enemy deployments. You can reinforce wherever things have gone worse than you expected. Um, and so you join them with Celestine if you want that extra durability. And like, if you think a real Overwatch threat will be beneficial, because at that point it's four hand flamers, one heavy flamer with a bonus AP. Because Celestine's sword is basically a heavy flamer at AP two. Um, so that's five d six shots, um, ignoring cover, automatically hitting. So as an Overwatch threat, that's actually fairly deadly. So it's in the ranged weapons, the Ardent Blade. Ignore cover Torrent, 6 two, one It's really good. Yeah, it's very good at killing one wound infantry, mm-hmm. it turns out. Yeah. Um, elves don't like it. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, so I, I think... Um, that's cool, that's to split up the units. A couple of utility units that you can definitely get a lot of value out of. Uh, and for and 70 points. Death Cult. Oh yeah, so 
70 points. They're, they're really cheap. I really like them. Um, I, I would love to find a way to fit another squad in. I just haven't quite managed it yet. Um, the Death Cult Assassins are a very just sort of like... People are like, why not run Crusaders? I'm like, well, because honestly, uh, Crusaders or Death Cult Assassins, both of them, if they get shot at, they're going to die. Unless the sickness quit, in which case they'll just roll by. <laughs> and one that would not die. <laughs> uh, um, but that being said, uh, yeah, they'll both die. The, the difference is that the Death Cult Assassins might actually kill something. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're a little faster, is the other thing. They move seven inches. They have precision uh, too, right? Uh, yeah, they have precision. They, they reroll wounds against uh, characters. Uh, and they're four attacks each that hit on twos with power swords. That's eight attacks hitting on twos. With those reroll ones against characters. It's bad. No. It'll kill Grotz. It'll kill Grotz like nobody's business. Um, so if you know you need to clear a squad aggression off an objective, these girls will do it. Yeah. The main the, the main reason they're in the list is to walk on and investigate signals. Yep, exactly. Do do a secondary and, and the then you're good. Yep. And then with any luck the opponent will forget they exist. Hopefully you won't forget they exist, which I have done before. So many times. Um, but yeah, but it's like it, and then, like in my game against Jack, they made a tangible difference because I brought them on to investigate a signal. Next turn, they advanced and they de-stickied an objective. Um, MVPs, thirty-five points. Yep. Uh, Jack couldn't do anything about it because he had no guns, and so, like that was the thing. Is like they're a small, cheap, good unit, and there's a citrus list that just runs nothing but this stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a real interesting way to play. It's not necessarily my style, but like I do respect it. Uh, but yeah, so like Death Cult Assassins, the only reason I have them is I had 10 points, reason one. Add 10 points, reason two, they kind of hit. You know, whereas Crusaders literally just stand there. Yeah. That's all they do. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if I had five more points to spare, this would be three Arctic Flight Fledgelings. Because at that point, you've got three, two, and models for the four field opinions. Like, that's even better. But. I, I think if the Crusaders but, had two wounds, then I would 100% take them over the other chicks. Oh, sure. But. Yeah. The, that one way. 35 points yeah. most of the time they make up their points just by doing one secondary and then boom they're done like that that's all they're there and, to do and if i need the 10 points somewhere else at some point i'll switch to crusaders exactly and the, i bring henchmen in um gray knights so like that 40 points all they're fucking doing is either coming on the board blocking out the backfield and just waiting till i pick investigate signals once i pick investigate signals they just run and just space for. yep and, and just Maybe. block out yeah, exactly absolutely so, so yeah, and so and then the last two squads. Uh, I'm excited uh, about Kalos. this squad. The, yeah, so the the Kalidus, everyone knows what the Kalidus does. Yes, yeah, everybody everybody knows her. Yeah. So sisters and Vinciates, uh I was sleeping on these girls for most of the edition so far. Uh, they were an addition to just just before Tampa. I added them, um, and I'm very glad that I did. They have been very good. Uh, not because of the squad themselves, but as a Palatine delivery mechanism, they've been very handy. Um, they're fairly cheap for 10 bodies, um, which, again, does require the opponent to at least commit enough guns to kill 10 bodies. Um, uh, yeah, they do have that sticks up invulnerable, so like they're still going to be every now and then some lucky saves. Uh, their damage output's nothing particularly special. They'll shoot enough to chip like a wound off here and there, but the main thing they give me is a sacred banner, which rerolls my advances and charges. So I got that charge reroll baked in, very handy. Uh, the Simulacra is cute. If you kill something, you get a Uh Their melee weapons are okay. I mean, they're AP zero, but they get two attacks apiece, so that's nice. Um, you know, the leaders of Power Sword, all of that is cute. But they have Impetuous Fervor, which is they reroll hit rolls of one. If the target is on an objective, they reroll all hit rolls. So when the Palatine joins this squad, at that point you have all hit rerolls and lethal hits. And the Palatine does her business. She discards a miracle die. She says, here's five dice, hitting on twos, re-rolling everything. Every six is a mortal wound and an AP2 damage three save. Have fun. Yeah. <laughs> and you just you just fish. Yeah. And and then when you're done, if there's anything left, you say, all right, now now here's another, I want to say like 15 or so dice that are AP zero saves. Roll another five before yep. your armor save is. Yep. And and the whole package is, I think, under 150 points. Yeah. Super cheap. So They're... It's just an incredibly affordable melee threat. 135 points. Yeah, it's wonderful. 45, 150, yeah. With, with the yeah. sword. So, but that's yeah. amazing for what so, she does. Yeah, and 
And again, the main thing that it gives you is it gives you it's relatively reliable at getting there. The rear wheel charges at ten bodies. They're OC two, uh, so you can charge into something, flip an objective, shit, a stop, soak up some of the hit back. So Navigians are actually, I think, a, a really nice one up squad. I think running three of them maybe is getting excessive. Um, but I think as a one of, they're definitely a really valuable unit. And I could see an argument to run more just as OC2 charges in, flips an objective unit. Like, I could see that. Um, I'm not sure it's as good if you don't have a character to kind of pump them up. But... Yeah. And, and would a, uh, I mean, what makes the Peloton so good is that fucking sword. But if you just have a basic Peloton, Peloton, sorry, would that be good just by yourself? Like just three Pelotines and then three Noviet squads. The value definitely drops off um, from the one that's really strong. The other ones would be like, okay. Uh -huh. You can also try attaching a Preacher for plus one to wound. So all of a sudden those Novitiates are all at least wounding on fives and fours and threes based on what they're going into. Uh, you could maybe go for the, uh, I think the, the Minister, I think is sustained hits. Um, or the like the Minister Priest. Um, so the mission is the one. I, I think he sustained hits, but um, yeah, the plus one and one might be better. It. Yeah. Yeah. So so like there's a few options there, but I think generally as a one of, I really like the squad. Um, I think as more than a one of, you're starting to get into sort of a the value becomes harder to justify unless you have a, a game plan in mind. Um, like if your game plan is throw three squads of ten arcoflagellants and Three squads with Novitiates and just a wave of infantry that they can't clear off the objective. If you're just playing Tyranids but sisters, I mean, maybe that's a game plan that works. I don't know. Um, but I think as a one of, that's really a great unit. So that's the list, really. It's as people have said and as people have kind of pointed out, it's, you know, it's just an honest list. And I think that's kind of its, its weakness and its strength. Its weakness is it has no one area in which it will just take any other faction and beat it out, right? Yeah. Um, but its strength is that there is no one area where it is really weak either. Um, it's just kind of solid across the board. And so as long as you can find your opponent's weak point and target that. Now, if my opponent is really good in melee, I can beat him in shooting. If he's really good in shooting, I can beat him in melee. Uh, if he's highly mobile, I can beat him in durability. If he's highly durable, I can beat him in mobility. You kind of just have to be able to play to the weakness of your opponent while kind of covering your own shortcomings. And it, it's difficult at times, but I think it's a lot of fun. And I think that the army gives you a lot of tools to do it. What I've always said about sisters as an army, um, especially if you're not playing in the Bloody Rose style, is there an army that really rewards resource management and timing, where basically you can't make your whole army better than other armies, like your stats are just a little bit weaker. But what you can do is you can invest a lot of resources into key areas that you've decided, like, this is important, this character matters. You can spend CP and Miracle Dice on that character and make them perform way above their pay grade. Um, and that's kind of where sisters really start to excel. So when you start finding those parts of the battlefield where you say, this is one that I've got to win, and you just invest invest miracle dice invest command points and all of a sudden that little combat that little brawly part and that's where i said sisters get really strong in the late game when it's down to these little brawls because a miracle die where you make one save doesn't matter a lot when you're throwing your whole armies at each other and you're saying roll seven saves roll six saves roll seven saves that one save doesn't matter a lot yeah but when you're in the late game and you're playing sisters and your opponent says all right I, you know i threw my last couple models at you here's three saves if you fail it you die it's like that one save suddenly is pretty powerful. Yep. But if it's two saves, I just half of that is dealt with. I just have to roll one save, and then after that, I'm good. Yep. The one save, oh, I failed it. CP reroll, I got it. Okay, miracle dice, I'm good. I'm hitting you back now. And like that can take some of these little scrappy fights and just push the lever on them. So miracle dice get more powerful the further into the game and the, the less powerful that both armies are. The impact of Miracle Dice and our stratagems gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So as a Sisters player, I think a lot of what people need to do is just sort of end tough in the early part where your stats aren't as good and get to that late game where you can actually say, all right, if I win here and here and here, I win this game. I can lose this unit. I can lose this fight. You know, these things aren't key to my score. These are the ones that are. I can invest all of my resources and all of my focus into these, these, these two spots and lock up the game. And that's, I think, 
something that you learn from getting some reps with the list of trying to, you know, what are the limits of, you know, when can I actually make it salvageable? Because there'll come a time when you can't save a character, like yeah. no matter what you do. Mm-hmm. You know, you can invest Miracle Dice and strats and rerolls. And like, like if Angron is going into a Peloton, she's going to die. I'm just like, there's nothing <laughs> um, and it's like, you know, if a Chaos Lord is going into a Palatine, unless he flubs those rolls, he's going to kill that Palatine. Mm-hmm. There's nothing you can do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so just learning when those things are happening so you don't invest them. Like, don't spend anything there. Like, you only spend if your opponent is, like, flubbed and prayed in an opening. Okay? Mm-hmm. Otherwise, it's like, you just... Knowing when to spend and when to hold it, I think, is one of the big skills of the Sisters play that you have to learn. Ultimately, your whole army is there to die as martyrs for the emperor. So don't get too attached to anyone. Um, that's that's one of the things I noticed when I was watching your games was, like, people would would just shoot, you know, sister of, of unit or shoot a unit of sisters, and you would just pick them up, like, all right, they're dead, you know, whatever. It's like they did their job by taking those shots or something like you you would just were so used to people dying <laughs> i'm like oh fuck my, my 160 point gray knight unit if they die i'm like down 160 points you're like nah this 50 point units whatever it's oh, dead it's yeah exactly like three of those units is still less than my one unit of, of gray knights so if i was going to describe battle sisters uh, like in terms of other armies i would kind of describe them as a combination of orcs of town um, specifically Kalyon Tau, I think. Um, sort of more of the sort of like the short range, like, haha, I ambushed you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then um, Guard. Guard, like, yeah. I would say Guard. The melding of those three. Mm-hmm. You've got the, the melee punch of orcs where it's like, surprise, I rocketed out and I punched you in the face. Yeah. <laughs> the sort of like, I hid behind a wall and then you got within the range of my volley of medicines. <laughs> and, uh, and you have the, I have people that are willing to go die to get this mission done of Guard. With some backup sort of teamwork. Tank, like, yeah. Yeah, sisters similar to Guard are a teamwork based army. None of your units are the best at what they are. But the combination of your units often is more than the sum of its parts. Definitely. So Battle Sisters are not an amazing infantry unit, but they're pretty good at buying space for your tanks to have multiple rounds of shooting where their steady damage that they do will add up. Yeah. Whereas. If, you know, it's not like one of those you know, vehicles where it's like, I'm going to just come out. It's not, it's not like an hammerhead or a fire prism that's going to come out and just deliver a knockout blow. But a castigator can do consistent chip damage to whatever it's shooting at. And if you can keep it alive and keep it kind of cushioned, then it will wear down any target. And that, I think, is where sisters really kind of shine. Because when you're having your units work together as a team. I could see it very similar as I keep comparing it to Grey Knights, obviously Inquisition, but when I play Grey Knights, even in 9th edition, but going into 10th edition specifically more, it's more of a surgical knife playing the game, like throwing one unit out to go do a specific thing, throwing another unit out to go a specific thing, another unit to go out a specific thing, instead of just fucking a machete going in and just try and cut down your opponent. It's, it's more surgical, trying to play for secondaries. <laughs> In ninth edition, Grey Knights had sort of the firepower to just kind of like pop out a bunch of squads and just kind of hose you down. Yeah. Uh, in tenth, you just don't quite have that kind of body count. No killing power yeah. whatsoever. Yeah, Grey Knights are really kind of out there trying to just teleport in, do their very defined roles. <laughs> yep. So, sisters are a little different in that I think um, we're more generalist just overall as a faction. A lot uh-huh. of our stuff is more sort of like generally competent. Yeah. Um, though for melee, you generally do have to be a specialist in melee. Our normal battle sisters are terrible at it. Like the worst <laughs> um, but that being said, but they make up for utility, like getting you the miracle dice. You know, being and, being and, too obsec on a, on a unit. They can, they can do some scoring work. They can do some shooting work. They can do some move blocking work. Like they have multiple roles they can fulfill, mm-hmm. uh, and that's true of almost every unit in the army. And so again, they they tend to work well as sort of like a my opponent's really fast. Okay, well I'm going to rely on my durability to sort of force them to come and engage me. So I can negate some of his mobility. Oh, my opponent's super durable. All right, well, I'm use the fact that I can, you know, move with with these transports and with, you know, war suits and sort of multiple ways of units. Some advance, some shoot, and you know, get around the the guy who's really durable and kind of wear him down before I commit for the actual attack. Uh, and so, you know, oh, my opponent's really good at melee, like we can strike. Well, you may have watched the game and noticed that I had a line of sacrificial ladies, uh, creating a six-inch buffer. 
uh, blocking charges <laughs> uh, on the first point because I just was like, I, I cannot let him touch my whole army. Yeah. Some of my army has to die so that the rest of it can live. The the, the mortifier. And against Quentin, it was the exact opposite. I was like, this guy's fast. I have to get on these objectives immediately and start moving them. And so that's what I did. And so I just, you know, as sisters, you have to be ready to adapt your gameplay. I think that's a big thing. Yeah. Uh, you can't go in with just a, like, this is how I play every game. Uh, you have to really kind of look at your opponent and say, what do they do well? And what are they weak at? Target their weakness. You can't, you can't try to beat them at their strengths. You, you won't do it. The sisters. You have to try and beat them at their weakness. Now, which one with these games that I have, uh, I actually have Dylan Williamson. Did you play him twice? I did. It's one of those weird quirks. Of <laughs> How did that work? Like yeah, playing so, the same opponent so, twice so, in the so tournament. Tampa, yeah, so Tampa, the way it works, the GW opens is they do four rounds, and then they split you into pods, basically, or brackets. Um, and then those brackets get paired inside the brackets. And so what happened is I went four and out, uh -huh. and I got stuck in the top bracket. Uh -huh. Stuck in the top bracket. Okay. <laughs> I got well, stuck in the top bracket. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, once you're ready, you can't leave. Uh, and so once you're in the shark tank, you're yeah. going uh, Got to kill some sharks. Uh, yeah, you got to start fighting the sharks. Punch them in the nose. Go. Uh, so yeah, so Dylan also made it, even though he was 3-1. If you were 3-1 and you had a good enough opponent record, basically if you fought tough enough opponents. Strength of schedule, yep. They were using yeah, they, yeah, they were using opponent records for your strength of schedule. And so if you fought tough enough opponents, and Dylan did, uh, you made it into the top bracket, and then you would get paired against someone in the top bracket. I just happened to be Wow. <laughs> yeah, we both independently went to the judges and were like, this isn't right. Yeah. I just played this guy. Yeah. And the judge was like, no, that's just the way it is. Wow. A less than 1% chance. It that's happened. so weird. Yeah, it was very strange. And so um, I don't know how you want to do this. Do you want to just go from round one through or just like pick and choose? I sure. Know. I mean, uh, usually the first couple of rounds, it's like, hey, you know, I'm playing, you know, some newer players, whatever it may be. But like when that it got. Oh, yeah. I mean, you look at your list. Your list is like insane. Yeah. So, so round one actually was very hard. And my Cody went seven and one. He was very good. Holy shit. <laughs> so first opponent of the day, you play that. Um, yeah, it was very tough to play Quarks. He had three uh, trucks full of Mega Knobs. He had a big squad of Squid Hunt boys. He had one truck full of Normal Knobs. It was just, a, there were almost no guns in his list. He had two Death Dreads. It was just... Walk. Walk into your face. <laughs> and you're gonna die. Yep. So I got the first turn. I blew up. I demeched two squads. I blew up about a third of his list before he touched me, and I still nearly got tabled. By wow. Him. Um, so definitely, orcs should not be underestimated. Yeah. Um, I squeaked that one out. Like that one was like a really very hard first game. The next game was against Tau um, with Matthew. Um, this was one where I think Tau is a pretty good matchup for me, as I mentioned previously. They get Miracle Dice can blank non-dev wound hammerhead shots. Yep. I've got a six showing. Um, and the Psychic Iron aren't great into me. Um, so, and the terrain wasn't giving him a lot of line of sight options. I was screening him well enough that he had to kind of deploy off to the side. Mm -hmm. And then his, his his crisis suits just, just bombed and then bomb saves. It was terrible. Damn. And so it just, he really kind of fell behind right off the get-go. Like he gave it a really good effort, but unfortunately there wasn't a lot he could do. Yeah. Uh, and then I went against uh, Nitz for game three, and this was Purge the Foe. And so um, shout out to Sebastian for being a great opponent, a lot of fun, and also for, thank goodness, playing Vanguard Nitz and being my opponent on Purge the Foe. Because Purge the Foe is a tough mission for my list. Because so I've got a lot of units. Um, and so I tend to give up a lot of primary. I got lucky. I got matched with someone who also had a lot of units. So thank goodness. Cause nice. the last time I was on this, I was against custodians. Oh tough God. Time. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you just tried, you just run away. <laughs> yeah. I actually got to score prime. Oh my God. So, it was a good game, but I think Vanguard Nets have a tougher time against me than other flavors of Nets. Um, just because like Von Ryan leapers are cool. But and these these are the new nids, right? The new codex. Yeah, you know, yeah, the new little okay. guys, the new mini lifters. Really, really cool. good, really good too. Like three of them in every yeah. list. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I really was impressed by them. I just thought they're very good in sisters. I'm still making four saves against them. Yeah. 
There are three wounds, and you know, a melted gun does three minimum damage uh, when you're in melted range. Makes so, sense. Unfortunately, th three wound infantry don't like sisters, typically speaking, <laughs> yeah. because we have a lot of melted weapons. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so that, that ended up working out for me. So then I played against Dylan, and so yeah, it, it's really weird playing against the same player twice, especially twice in a row. Back to back. Kind of all is weird. Yeah. Uh, and so I can understand why generally you don't do this. Because I played against Dylan, he was a great opponent, I really do want to give him props. Um, you know, really just all of my opponents this event had nine fantastic games of player. That's awesome. Like, that, that's really the like, best. That's the best going to GT. To all of my yeah. yeah like, I, I have nothing but nice things to say about all my opponents. Um, and so, but yeah, Dylan was an awesome sport and, you know, a good player. Um, I mean, he was already 3-0 when, when I went up against him. Um, but in the game one, I think, unfortunately for him, he actually got a little lucky. Um, in terms of his saving throws and his field of hands. Uh -huh. He got unlucky with the fact that the Omega objective was the one that he was least prepared to score because we were on supply drop. Got it. So he deployed favorite one side of the table and some of his units just couldn't make it there to contest the primary at the end. That's why I squeaked out that win. Um, but because of that, I think he had a false sense of security of how durable his stuff was. He had a little bit of hot rolling in the game one. And so game two, he was very aggressive to try and kind of like close it out. And uh, this is where the retributors came in um, he moved his, his squig hog boys, six squig hogs with a knob, up to prepare them for a charge on the wall next turn. Turn one, right? Um, yeah, and so my turn one, I, I, I just thought, I'm going to go for it. <laughs> and I sent my retributors <laughs> and their emulator right up to them, uh -huh. up them out. One castigator could see they killed two of them with a the battle cannon, which mm. was already pretty good. Mm. Um, and then uh, the rush just picked up the entire rest of the squad, and that should not happen. Mm. Uh, and he just got just ripped through, and he, he rolled pretty poorly at that point. But I think because he had the expectation from the prior game to kind of set him up for failure there, or he kind of thought he knew what the damage would be, and then it ended up spiking and you know when the luck flipped around it just really threw his game plan off he still gave me a pretty good game but at that point i think he was just really far behind do you have a lot of games into orcs like in, in your meta or not yeah. really i i, I haven't yeah, played so orcs yet in 10th edition first time i played orcs in 10th edition that is insane that is insane and and uh, going into cody game one and then two fucking back-to-back -back orc orc games after that yeah so you probably know orcs now well, I, I know i know what orcs do now. exactly exactly now. Uh, I also know what mids do now. So my next game was John Lennon, and this was the closest game of the whole event. Uh, John Lennon was an awesome opponent. Again, huge props to him. Um, and actually, I thought I'd lost this game when we ended it. Um, wow. Because we were, it was game six, we were exhausted, weren't really following very well. And so we reached into the game. I thought, game's over. I've lost. Great. Um, you know, awesome game. It's been a great run so far. I really feel good about it. Yeah. Um, and then um, Jack Robster is like, did you count all your points? Apparently, John had written them all down, but hadn't done the math yet. Um, so John had just taken me at my word when I said that he won. And then I said, I think I did. He's like, just check. And so I checked, and I had not entered secondaries for one of my turns. Um, and we actually tied 69 to 69. Nice. All right. Auto wins. Um, Auto wins right there. So that that was yeah, a big that, one, that was a big thing that, we that got talked about in, in the area. We went to tiebreakers. Yeah. yeah. We went to tiebreakers. Um, and it just happened to be that the way John had played, the way that the game had broken down, John was down. He had two basically full health um, exocrines, uh -huh. and that was about it. And the tiebreaker was who controlled more objectives. And I had, I want to say, like seven or eight, like one to two model units left. That wow. Could, like, yeah. And so at that point, it was just, it was, it was a given at that point. Yeah. The, the tiebreaker, just, he could not win that. That's crazy. Um, and so, yeah, it, it really was like, it was an incredible game. Like, we both, I think, made some really good, some, some. I wouldn't say we made many mistakes, either one of us, really. Uh, but, um, but like John, definitely, like that yeah, was an incredibly tense game. So then I went into the shadow round. Uh, I played against. Let's see. I want to make sure I get his name. Uh, Colin, and he was running the, the Vanguard Swarm. I don't know if you saw it. The um, three squads of six Von Ryan Leapers and three squads of six Raveners. It was Vanguard Nids, and it was literally his list was turn one, I'm charging you with everything. <laughs> oh my god. So turn one, I had 18 Von Ryan Leapers and a Wind Tide Tyrant in my army. Uh, what? And uh, I was like, and so I, I just looked at him, I told him, I was like, all right, I think I either kill all of this or I lose the game. Yeah, yeah. So so was he in combat with you turn one or in front of you? Yes. Oh, in oh, combat. No, he was in combat with me turn one. 
Uh, he killed one squad of Battle Sisters completely, and I think a Mortifier and like half of another infantry squad, and like injured a few other things. Okay. And then I just kind of fell back yeah. with some of the stuff uh -huh. and shot it all, and then the, the stragglers were picked up by Vault in melee. Okay. And that was his entire front wave was dead. So then at that point, it's just like, all right, I, I have nothing to combat that again. Yeah, he had one more wave of Raveners. Uh -huh. You know, three, three squads and six Raveners. And picked up like one or two more infantry squads. Actually, no, they only killed up one because I was just able to stick vehicles in front. And they're not very good at killing vehicles. Got it. Uh, and then at that point, he was just out of gas. Yeah. And so that was the end of the game. And I mean, we both kind of knew. It's like when he did that big charge, it's like either I kill it all and win or I don't kill it all and I lose. Seemed like you killed it all pretty confidently, too, with all the melts. Like just popping out, just dead. And battle cannons are really good at killing three wound infantry. There you go. Like Minus one, saves. ignore cover. Yeah, Fuck. So, yeah, five up saves. Good luck. Saves are tied. Good luck. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it was one of those games where it's like he just looked at my list and he was like, I think you have what it takes to kill my list. And I was like, I think you have what it takes to kill a lot of my list, the infantry. So we'll see. But like, if I kill your list, yeah, if I get to shoot you, it's bad for you. And I, I got to shoot it. So that was Can you use a miracle die for the amount of attacks for the battle cannon? You cannot. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure you cannot. Okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure, but you can use it for hit, wound, damage. Uh, you can use it for battle shock rolls, which is pretty big. Yeah. Um, you cannot use it for leadership, but you can use it for battle shock. Go figure. What is this the did this check. what is the main things you use it for throughout the game? Is I it mainly use it for damage. Damage, okay. Uh, damage and saves. And saves. Damage and saves are the two primary things that I'll spend miracle dice on. I'll also spend them on charges. Uh, if I have like an eight-inch charge, I'll spend the six and look for the two. Mm. I did fail that once. I saw I, that. I saw that one. But over the weekend, I think I failed that three times. But you you guys happen. both failed a lot, it though. Yeah, yeah. So it, it always comes around. No uh -huh. matter how bad your dice are, it eventually comes around. It yeah. may take a game. To yeah. It, but it eventually comes around, always. Like, you will never have the bad dice for the whole event. It just, it always eventually turns around. That's just how dice work. Um, so, yeah. So that was the end of my, my second day. I was completely flabbergasted. <laughs> How, how, am I, how am I still playing? Uh, <laughs> oh, they, they turned the lights off on us. Uh, we were in like the shadow shadow realm of the shadow realm. Wow. Um, and so we were watching uh, Eldar versus Chaos. Um, I didn't know who to root for because um, if Chaos won, Eldar would have lost, which, you know, yay for the current meta. You know, people still feel that way about Eldar. Chaos are really people good, though. Water, that's a fade. Um, and then, but on the other hand, if the Eldar player won, he and the other two people who were in already had gold tickets, so I would have been sure to get one. Oh, cool. And I still didn't think I was going to win the whole thing, so I was kind of like, uh, I'm rooting for both of you, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so, w would you rather have played me. Chaos or Eldar? Um, With your list. I, I, didn't actually, I did not look at that Eldar list, so I can't tell you for sure. Um, I will say that the next round, I did get who, who I wanted. I wanted Quentin for, 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 for the 7th or 8th round. Specifically because I looked at his list and I thought, he doesn't have a ton of stuff to kick Servo Skulls with. That, that dude, the only I saw that video live on the thing. Not live, but like when it was recorded. And yeah. he, like, you, I wouldn't say lucked out, but like getting that mission, it was just like, holy shit, you got 20 some points in, in a turn. And at that point, it's yeah. like, he couldn't really do anything. Like, you just had and so many things. Servo Skulls is a very imbalanced mission oh my god it was it was insane it, it is the worst mission in the pack yeah um, easily first was hugely beneficial for me i think i would have still had a shot going second but it would have been much more difficult um but the thing is like i went first so i got to i basically got to dictate the placement of the servo skulls for almost the entire game that meant that primary was basically mine um, and so that if i'd gone second i would have had to actually steal some of the service girls from him, but at the same time, he was down to just the Wraith Guard. Yeah. So I think Nick with uh, by turn three. Yeah. And that was the thing. So I looked at his list and I said, I can actually potentially maneuver around this to move the servo skulls and actually score points. Yeah. As I looked at Jack's list and I said, if I'm playing him on that, I lose. Oh my so god. Fun. Yeah. Like, uh, and so that was a really lucky break for me. I mean, I mean Jack even could do things like sticky them and then they kick themselves as they're running. Away. Holy like, shit. That's a you thing? Can really silly, yes. If you control it. If you control it, you move it. That is amazing. Um, you can do some some comically weird things on that mission. It's a as I said, deploy servo skulls is a terrible mission. It, the go first win rate on it is super high. It's like old school it's, missions that used to like 
capture the thing and run it across the yeah, old school missions. Oh, so I will 100% say that me going first was a huge benefit for me. And like, of the matchups I could have gotten, uh, that was the one where I wanted to fight Quinn. I didn't want to fight Quinn on one of these other missions where he could have, you know, really just kind of taken advantage of this Wraith card and bombed me off and just like, you know, just sort of like played the game he wanted to play. Um, I really benefited from it being Servo Skulls. Now he's having to deal with this wrinkle of these stupid moving objectives giving him a headache. And me just throwing waves of sisters to get in his way while he's trying to get to these objectives. Yeah. So... And what would you, what would be your suggestion for server skulls? Like, do you just want to keep pushing them forward as much as possible? If you go first, pull them back so that they can't control them. But keep them where you control them. So at the end of their turn, you push them forward, and then you go to your turn and you push them again. At that point, they're in the six inch range to score points. Uh, but yeah, you basically your goal. If you watch that video and you only pay attention to where the server skulls are, and you you know sort of tune out the commentators and everything else that's going on all the units. You'll notice that basically what happened is I kept them bouncing around on his half of the board. They never, they tended not to get all the way in his deployment, so I would get them barely in a couple times. Um, but basically what was going on is I was just trying to keep moving them away from me and towards him, but mostly just keeping it so he was only scoring within 12s, not uh, scoring within 6 or inside. Um, so I was just focusing, like... Again, I was throwing away units to, to, to do this. Like, yeah. unit squad literally just marched to the <laughs> to yeah. just to kick it one time because it meant that he would never get it into my deployment zone. So, that makes sense. That's um, awesome. Uh, maybe the last turn of the game. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the point. Is just, you know, you're sending up waves of troops to say, you know, move these, kick them away. I think the highest priority in service goals is to maintain control of them mm -hmm. because you really don't want your opponent. Because the one thing that Quentin could have done that would have just ended the game for me is if he'd gotten all three of them in range of the, the Wraith Guard, because at that point I would never be able to, to move them again. And he could just send all three into my deployment zone. Mm. I mean, you could technically stack the stupid things. Wow. Uh, so can they be on top of each other? Yes, yeah, so you could have one stack of three objectives <laughs> right into my, object, my deployment zone. At that point, there would be nothing I can do. That just so, seems dumb. It, it is dumb. The mission is dumb. Like, there is no one in the scene who will tell you that the point service calls is not a very silly mission. Yeah. Um, so the fact that it was mission seven was interesting. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, it was one where I think both of us had a shot to win. Um, I think even going second, I had a shot. It would have been a lot harder. But like, I, I do think it would have been possible. Um, like, I think that is a game that is winnable. It's just uphill. I think the same is true for Quentin going second. I think he could have won it. Um, he just needed more things to go his way. Um, I think he probably, if he had really committed with those Wraith Guard one turn sooner, he might have been able to push the bottom two in. Um, the danger of doing that, of course, is that I would have had free reign at the top that I didn't have. So at that, at that point, you're in a lot of what if territory. So, I mean, what if Celestine came back? What exactly, if exactly. Came back? Yeah. You know, what if the Avatar made one more invulnerable save? At that point, it's kind of like, who knows? Exactly. That's Up like, in the what air. What if I didn't completely whiff with my retributors? Uh, so, like, it's, these things happen. Like, at that point, you can't really ask those questions too much. Uh, so, finally, I played against Jack. Um, on We went from the silliest mission of the pack to the most basic, you know, meat and potatoes mission of the whole pack. Totally here for it. Um, with the one wrinkle of player placed objective markers, the judges did not have an answer for whether or not there should be one set in the middle. So, Jack and I just had a gentleman's agreement that the first objective goes in the middle. So that way we play a somewhat real game of 40k. Huh. But the whole point of that is to wherever. place it wherever you want, though. Well, yeah. The, but a lot of places will do it where the first one goes in the middle and then you get to place the two in the deployment zones and the other two in no man's lands. And that way you get to shape it, but it doesn't end up being completely lopsided because then the first trick turn roll off could have decided the game. Yeah. Yeah. Then that's, that's most of the time so. of that mission. And so that's why Jack and I said, we want to play a real game of 40K. We're going to have one in the middle, and then we'll place the rest. And gotcha. So Jack placed very close to the middle with his other two. Uh, I placed my two, and my main focus was keep these where I can shoot them, basically, in case I don't get that side. Um, because I'm not worried about Jack shooting me. He's world leaders. Yeah. Um, so I don't need to be in cover. I just need to be on it. Yep. Um, and then I won the side roll off, and I decided I'm going to take Jack's side, because at that point I can just be on that, and I can see the ones that I had deployed. So I can see four of them, basically. I have access to four of the five objectives. And then my goal was just survive and score points. <laughs> you know, and I survived and scored points. And 
Um, I think Jack made one mistake that I would kind of call out is that instead of sending in Mercatus to clear me off the objective, he sent his other corn guy, the one who let him reroll re -roll his blood type. And I think he did that because he didn't expect him to go down that fast. Mm, yeah. Um, and so and I, I think it was also, it was game nothing. Yeah, true. <laughs> oh, true. Uh, yeah. And, and it was like a really minor thing. Like the guy only barely died. So, uh -huh. Like he, he almost lived. So. Yeah. Like there's a lot of like there's a lot of yeah go to what should is that you know you don't really worry about. It's like you know he played a really good game and like some of his fight phase maneuvers were really clever, really well done. So it's like I want to give mad props to all the people I played against. I mean they were playing against a list that they've never seen, a faction they barely played against, with tricks that they you know I explained to them, but. By, by game nine, your your short term memory is pretty shot. It's so bad. Uh, and so <laughs> you, like, you mess up like, little you things. Know, like, yeah, well, but, I mean, it's like you know, you're not going to remember the list of scraps that your opponent told you. Yep. When you're like when you're, I want to say like twenty hours in. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, like, you have really burned you know, the midnight oil. Yep. You're, you're on both ends of your candle, and you're down to the stub. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and you're kind of running on instinct at that point. <laughs> and so, so, yeah, I mean, it was a Again, I had some lucky breaks. I had some unlucky breaks. Um, I, I, I think at the end of the game, end of the day, I think that sisters have a lot more going on than people give credit for. Um, and I think a lot of it is down to their flexibility. Uh, I think you have to be, if you want to play sisters right now, you've got to be ready to play a flexible combined arms shooting army, not a melee advance and charge army. Yep. That's just not what we are anymore. Yep. And, I understand. I, I feel bad for people who have a collection with 30 Retro, you know, 30 Repentia, 30 Zephyrim. But, I mean, the Codex is going to come out. You're going to get Bloody Rose. It's going to hit people. Uh, your time will come. And in the meantime, maybe take the opportunity to dust off some of those battle sisters and, like, emulators and stuff and just give them a go. You may yeah. enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, uh, like, th like, that's my advice. And if, if your sister's playing and you're just looking for, like, you know, oh, I just really don't know how to make it work, like, Honestly, just the meat and the potatoes of the, the index or the, the best value is, in my opinion. Just go generate a, just a handfuls of miracle dice and be like, I can just have sixes. This is great. So I'm many dice. So many dice. It's wonderful. So many dice. I've got all these flaws with one multi melta, so every one of them can get one of these sixes for damage. It's awesome. That is amazing. So it's like once you, once you take that approach, I think you'll find that there, there's a lot to enjoy. Um, and don't get too attached to any one unit because at the end of the day, there, one wound, T3 infantry. Yep. And, I mean, and, and you know, I mentioned how Sacrosons went off their two up save, but I'm going to tell you, even with a two up save, when your army is an army that lives and dies by the saving throw alone, you're going to have games where it just all falls apart. You just have to learn to roll with it. Um, I have had a squad of eight Sacrosons die to seven Poxwalkers <laughs> without mortal wounds. It just rolled nothing but points. Oh my and god. Just, yeah. It does. So you, you just have to learn to roll with it. Like I mean, you're gonna have games where your your army just folds in on itself, and then halfway through that game, one of your squads is gonna be like, "What if I made every single Fiona Bay? Like, you know, what is Mortifier is gonna just be like, "I'm gonna take or last cannon to the face, be alive on this objective, score you primary points, and then I'm gonna charge this tank and I'm gonna cut it in half with three sustained hits, and it's just gonna blow your mind." And you're gonna be like, "Awesome, that's just dice." Like. So you can't plan around any of that. And so I think what makes people make it to the top bracket is they've played the game in a way that that can happen and they can still score enough points to it. That, that makes so much sense. I, I, think, I, I think that is definitely the biggest takeaway for such a player. Don't forget how to score points. Like you want to kill the opponent, but you don't get, unless you're playing versus the foe, you don't get points for it. Um, so when you're killing the opponent, all you're doing is you're trying to buy yourself time to go score points. What would be the biggest change of, like, would you change anything of your list from how many times you run it and tweaked it and stuff like that? Or is this, like, a good, this is an all-comers list? Like this. I, I honestly really like how the list plays. It's very hard for me to find things that I can cut. Uh -huh. There are things that I want to add to this list. I really want to add the Demon Fuge to this list, especially with CSM being as good as they are. I would really like to run the Demon Fuge. A, I just love the character. B, anti chaos two up with fights first and precision. A squad of chosen really doesn't like that. Um, charging in and having their chaos lord potentially get just punched in the face. Yeah. They don't like. Yeah. Uh, and so, like, there's definitely a value there to the Demonic Fuge. Um, she's a lone operative. 
deep strike, all that. So th there's units like that that I'm looking at. Like I'd like to get her in. Uh, I'd like to fit a third mortifier in if I can. Uh, but again, the problem is so many of these things in this. Every unit in my army at Tampa at one point or another was really beneficial to me. Yeah. Uh, there it's were tough. no units in my army that at the end of the event I looked back and said, "Man, this didn't do anything." Yeah. So that that actually makes it really hard to change anything on the list because at, at the end of the day, they all. So, yeah, it's a different list once you start changing that much stuff just to bring in a couple different uh, units. So at some point, I'd like to try the Triumph. I'd like to see how it, how it feels and all that. So I may make a different list and, and give it a run at some RTT, see how I like it. Um, but you know, I've pretty much settled on a style at this point that I like, of uh, sort of the combined arms, mechanized sisters, where I've got a lot of support pieces anchoring around a couple of sort of you know good armored units and some good infantry support. Like I just really like the combined arms all around her approach. It's just how I enjoy playing. I like having a toolbox with a whole lot of tools in it, and then just trying to figure out which one to use um, in any given situation. Um, and I can see, you know, why people would rate that lowly because when you, you know, when you pair this list up against world leaders, I lose in melee by an astonishing margin. If you pair me up against Tau, I lose in shooting by a pretty reasonable margin. If you pair me up against Eldar, it's up. It's like are the other factions at their strengths, I am outclassed, but. I like the depth of options that the faction gives me and the tools that Miracle Vice and our strats give us are often very high impact uh, as long as you put them out at the right time. And I really like that. You know, there's some some books only have things like, you know, oh, well, I've got a strat for a swim in it. <laughs> I, I find those to be the least interesting kinds of strats. Yeah. Like our least interesting strat is plus one wounded melee. Wow. But all of our other strats are really quite interesting. Like, like plus one wounded melee, it's good. And I use it relatively often um, just to get the palatine in and do damage. But um, we've got some really unique strats that, you know, reviving a character is really interesting because you can do stuff like put a character out to control an objective against a shooting army and just let them kill you. Then you stand up and control the objective anyway. Yeah. Uh, like, like that, that's just a, a great strat. It's just one CP over an objective. Awesome. Um, because of the timing, it comes back to the end of the phase. They can't do anything about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And so there's things like that. Or suffering and sacrifices, in my opinion, one of the single best and most interesting strats out there. Um, where I get to decide how my opponent allocates his attacks in combat. That's huge. Um, so in my game against Jack, just as an example, the very last thing that I did. Um, uh, so the very first thing, I guess, against Angron. I shot him with everything that could shoot him. I dropped him to four minutes. And so uh, I put the Palatine there, and she was going to go in, and she was going to finish the job. But I was aware that sometimes you just flub the roll. Like, sometimes your rolls just don't. And so I charged him with my, ret my, my retributors as well. <laughs> so I spawned five retributors charged and run. Not because they were going to do any damage. Whatsoever. Oh, my God. Because if I flubbed, I was going to have Angron kill the Retributors and not the Palatine. And then we would rotate turns, and I would fight before Angron did, and I would have the second shot. Smart. I didn't end up beating two because I hit him really hard with the Palatine, and she just rolled in a lot of lethal hits. Smart. Um, but if she hadn't, uh, I had that as my backup plan. And that's the thing. That, that's what Sisters really gives you. Is it gives you some of these really unique tools, because we don't have the tools that you expect from... Uh, like we don't have advance and charge. We don't have advance and shoot. We don't have much fall back and do anything. We don't have deep strike within three inches. Like our tool set is very unique to perfection. Yeah. Which is a lot of fun and it's very interesting. Um, and so I think if you are a sisters player, instead of trying to just say, oh, I just want to be a really fast charging punch people army, experiment with our weird stuff. Because we've got some really cool weird stuff. So I think if I have any one takeaway for sisters players, it's that there's actually a lot of fun interesting stuff you can do with the codex it may take you some practice to get used to it but i think at the end of the day you can really get some value and have a good time. there's just so many different every game you play is going to be different which is what's so cool about it. it's like you have so many different tools in your tool belt that you can do different things almost every single game like look at the game you played against orcs back to back i'm sure both games were completely different uh with the secondaries and all that stuff now did you play did you take tactical every single time uh, almost. Okay, which ones did you take fixed? First one against Cody. And why? Uh, because his list, um, because he gave up maximum for assassinate and bring it down, uh -huh. because he also took fixed against me, 
So I knew exactly what his game plan was going to be, which was run at me. Okay. So I didn't have time to be doing anything except shoot him to death before he punched him to death. And so at that point, I took base because I was like, this is just going to be a damage race. I just have to win a damage race. Got it. Uh, so I barely did. <laughs> but like that was the one time I took fix. Typically, I take tactical because we just aren't very well suited for behind enemy lines. We're not fast enough. Teleport Homer, we're not really durable enough against every army to really rely on that. Yeah. In the middle or behind enemy in a deployment zone. Like it, it, that was very difficult. Uh, in case you're on quarters, same problem. And if Junith dies with tactical, you can at least get CP. But, True. Yeah. Because. Legitimately, you want to throw a grenade every turn, man. Yeah, like it, easily. It's so, it's so good. Easily. Yeah, grenade is my favorite strat now, fun. easily. With like every army I play, always grenades. A, a cursed yeah, cultist can throw grenades. Throw grenades. Always throw grenades. A cursed cultist Gosh, can literally yeah. just pass the grenade all the way up to the front and just yeah. chuck it. Oh, it's wonderful. It's hilarious. It's, wonderful. So, it's like, oh, they yeah, can they uh, can throw grenades? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, every sister's infantry model has grenades. That's awesome. Uh, so yeah, it's just like yeah, just 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 throw grenades at people. Just throw grenades. If You're not, good. Them over. I mean, in my game against Quentin, the uh, announcers, you know, they, they caught it. They didn't know why I was doing it. I had uh, no prisoners, and I scored max no prisoners because I tank shocked with my emulator and built the way leaper. <laughs> yeah, you know? the comment commentators uh, were like answering the questions. Alive. Yeah, the commentators yeah. were were answering questions for new players instead of like the deep dive of like what the hell he's doing their job was yeah that kind of is what their job was and because they didn't have like direct access to the tables yeah uh, it'd be hard for them to get like really direct answers um yeah if i was going to give gw advice i'd say you know maybe go to the war games live guy and steal his program that he uses for secondaries where the table enters their scores yeah so that, that, that way they don't have to worry about it they just know immediately when we score something yeah um but like whatever I, the, the main goal at the GW events for the commentators is to make it accessible for people who don't really know Warhammer very well, mm -hmm. people who aren't really tournament players. And so I think that the team does a really good job at that. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I really do appreciate the, the work they're doing and how difficult that is. Glad they're trying to grow it as well. Mm -hmm. So. And they, they ran a great event. I mean, shout out to the tournament staff. Like, I've been to two GW events now. Both of them were wonderful experiences. That's awesome. Um, anytime I can make it to one. I, I love to do so. They're really having a good time. So if you have one in your neck of the woods ever, uh, I recommend them. You and the audience, you know, just, if you can't make it to one and it's like you don't have to fly, it's just like within a drive, definitely try to carve out the weekend for it because they're a good time. Jeff, are you going to uh, are you going to LVO? Uh, I have not figured out LVO yet. I will be going to Atlanta for the finals. Nice. Uh, so that'll be fun. So, and my next tournament, my next big tournament I'll be going to um, is going to be up in Maryland at the uh, uh, Flames of Autumn GT. So, I'll be up there. Awesome. Well, good luck with that. Congrats on the GT, the huge GT win. Like, I really appreciate you coming to the channel and, and talking about it. I love just Absolutely. picking your brain and, like, getting the insight of why you pick these specific units. Because that's, that's where people are going to learn the most is going over each specific unit, why you take it, how you're gonna deploy it, why you're deploying it that way, when do you split up squads, when don't you split up squads, tactical fix, like that's gonna get most people better at sisters than just saying, here's the list, this is what I played against, good luck figuring it out, you know? Yeah. Good luck, yeah. No, it, <laughs> it's a passion where it rewards reps, so I think the best advice I can give to people is get out and lose some games. You learn a lot when you lose, as long as you're willing to not take it personally. Um, I mean, the first event I went to, I think I went, I, I can't remember if it was 0 and 3 or 0 2 1. <laughs> um, but, you know, you get that. Yeah. I mean, it's just a lot of practice and, you know, getting comfortable with, you know, how does my own army work? Um, and, you know, I know some guys who switch armies every time they lose, and it's like, you're not going to learn nearly as much that way. Uh, I think, you know, you know, guys like Jack such great fundamentals that you can switch to world leaders and actually play them all the way to the finals of an event of that size yeah um that's because he's coming in with a massive backlog of experience mm -hmm. that most of us don't have yeah so i think for most people it would really behoove them just spend some time with a faction even if you're not winning just get that experience kind of learn how it works um find out why you're not winning you know how why you're struggling to score points you know and just learning that and you can decide that way when you switch factions you know what you're, you know, I don't like this about my faction, so I want a faction that has a different set of strengths that covers up and fits me better. 
Okay, that, that's perfectly reasonable, but then you can only really make the decision once you've got some experience and some knowledge firsthand. Definitely. Well, cool. What well, I mean, I appreciate it. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Uh, if you guys have any questions, you did join the Discord. Uh, you can hit them up uh, on, on Discord. Ask them in the sister channel. Um, but thanks, you know, for for joining. If you guys have any questions, leave it in the comments below. Uh, I'll be sure to answer them as soon as possible. And look out for Jeff's name because he's gonna fucking take over the sisters <laughs> meta right now. You're gonna see so many more sisters come out of the, come out of the woodworks and join the tournament scene. Thanks to uh, Jeff here. So. Jeff, appreciate it. Two other lists out there, so you keep an eye out. I think there's gonna be some really interesting lists for Ivy Kevin. I'm looking I'm, I'm looking out for your name in the next couple couple GTs. So Jeff, appreciate it. And uh guys, thanks for joining the stream. Good luck and we'll see you another uh, video soon.